Welcome everyone to our featured speaker event for Arlington Eco Week and the kickoff for the spring series of community conversations. I'm Rachel Oliveri, School Sustainability Coordinator for the Arlington Public Schools and one of the Eco Week organizers. For those who are new to Eco Week, this is an annual celebration raising awareness and inspiring action on behalf of our planet. Eco Week continues through this Saturday, May 15th and includes both outdoor and online activities. During Eco Week, you can learn about local climate resiliency projects, opt up for more renewable energy through Arlington Community Electricity, discover what is happening locally, nationally, and globally to stop plastic pollution, participate in litter cleanups, and enjoy plant sales and bake sales to support our school gardens and student green teams. I encourage everyone to see our full list of activities at arlingtonma.gov slash ecoweek. Great, thanks Rachel. Um, so I'm Jill Harvey. I am the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Division Director for the Town of Arlington. And I just wanna thank everyone for tuning in tonight. And I'm really excited for this opportunity to collaborate with Eco Week um, to feature Parker McMillan Bushman. Um, and so this is also the kickoff for the Community Conversations, um, which is some programming that started last year um, when we took an effort to sort of dive into some of the more difficult conversations about racism and reforms and what's needed. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to bringing back that series and having Parker here tonight to assist with kicking that off. We've got a couple more events lined up that'll take place in June and July. So look out for those. Um, but now I'm going to introduce you to Parker. So we're really excited to have you here. And you're joining us from Colorado, um, where she lives and works. And Parker has a passion for equity and inclusion and conservation and the outdoors. Her interest in justice, accessibility, and equity issues developed from her personal experiences facing the unequal representation of people of color in nonprofit and environmental organizations. Parker tackles these complex issues by addressing them through head-on activism and education. In Colorado, she works with environmental organizations to aid them in building culturally diverse and culturally competent organizations that are representative of the populations that they hope to reach and serve. In addition to Parker's role at Colorado State University Extension, she is also the founder of a DEI consulting firm called Eco Inclusive, the creator of Queen Work, and Queen stands for Keeping no, keep widening environmental engagement narratives and the co-founder of Inclusive Journeys. So thank you, Parker, for joining us in Arlington this evening. And it's all yours. Oh, just a few more tips. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have um, closed captioning available. So if you need that, you should be able to see that on the bottom part of your Zoom. Um, that should also be next to either the chat button or the Q&A. We do ask if you have questions, which we're gonna save to the end please start to put them in the Q&A box. Um, so we'll save those and we'll discuss those and chat with Parker after her presentation. Now the floor is yours. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so excited to be here uh, this evening. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and people. They're the original stewards of the land that I occupy uh, here in Colorado. And I also would like to acknowledge all other indigenous tribes and nations that call Colorado home. I'm so excited to be here this evening and I'm gonna be sharing my screen with you to share uh, some slides. So we are going to be talking about uh, the importance of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion to conservation efforts, right? And outdoor and environmental engagement. Um, I am, once again, Parker McMullen Bushman. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I wanna start off by telling you a little bit about myself, my background, how I came to this work. 
I am, uh, like Jill already said, I am currently the director of extension uh, through Colorado State University for the city and county of Denver. I also sit on a number of national and local boards um, that have a lot in common and that they deal with uh, people and the outdoors and nature and often have goals around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in those spaces. In addition to my uh, day job and professional um, jobs, I also have a number of what my dad calls my side hustles. Um, I, on social media, have the, the name Queen Work, and I post about and talk about um, this kind of intersection of social justice movements and the outdoors. And why does it matter, right, when we are talking about the environment? I'm also the founder of Eco Inclusive. Um, I've been working in the conservation and outdoor recreation field for a long time. And along the way, as I noticed that organizations were working to tackle these issues of inclusion in these spaces, um, you know, I, I formed this organization to do just that, to help organizations in their journey. I am the co-founder of Inclusive Journeys, and Inclusive Journeys is uh, an interesting, um, it's a tech startup. If you'd asked me three years ago if I would have been the co-founder of a tech startup, I would have said no. But um, Inclusive Journeys is a tech startup, and we are actually going to be launching starting in the Denver metro area this summer. And what it is, is it's basically a review website for inclusion. Um, we're hoping to do for diversity and inclusion what Yelp has done for customer service. So people are going to be able to go onto the site and uh, rank the places that they visit, right? The businesses that they, they visit, outdoor spaces that they visit for how welcome they felt, how safe they felt, how celebrated in regards to their identity when visiting these spaces. And so we're really excited about uh, how we've developed uh, this website and the launch. I am also the founder of Summit for Action, which is a yearly summit where we tackle um, justice and inclusion issues. Um, I have a family and I always like to brag on them. I've got three kids and me and my husband are both environmental educators. So we spend a lot of time in the outdoors uh, with our children and we love nature so much that we actually named our kids after trees. So there's cypress, cedar and conifer, our three little saplings. Um, like I said earlier, I have been in this uh, career uh, around conservation, environmental education, outdoor recreation uh, for the past 20 four years now. And I've gotten the opportunity to work all over the United States at lots of different organizations. Um, it's been an interesting journey. And along the way, there was often a question that, that I got asked, right? No matter where I was, was working. And that was, you know, how did you get here? How did you come come to this profession? How did you get here? Right? They weren't asking, like, did you drive that day? Did you fly in? They wanted to know, how did I, as a woman of color, make it into a field where there weren't a whole lot of people that looked like me, honestly? And it wasn't a silly question because I often was on teams like these where I was the only uh, person of color. And so I started to wonder myself, right? I started to look around me and say, oh, there aren't a whole lot of people of color doing education in the environmental um, realm. And why, why is that? Why uh, was I often the only one and didn't see other people that looked like me? And what was it that led me to this field? Maybe, maybe the answer was in, um, what how I got here right and uh, that's certainly what other people thought um 
but I realized that it wasn't such a clear shot for me because actually I never considered myself an environmentalist. I never considered myself um, an outdoorsy type person for many, many years. And so um, when I examined my background and I started to think about how my journey to nature came, right? I started to say, what is what was the thing that brought me here and what was my first connection to what I now understand as the natural world. And that first connection came from my mother. So um, my mother was born in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, she grew up on a little farm out there on James Island on a piece of land that was sandwiched in between two pieces of marsh. Um, she ran around barefoot, she got to play outdoors, and she loved being outdoors. When she got older, she decided to move and she took, you know, it, I love this picture of her on the right because she just uh, looks so sassy with her rolled up, um, her rolled up bell bottom jeans, right? She decided to move to New York. She moved to the Bronx. And in the Bronx, she met my dad and uh, they got married and they had three kids. And they raised us on, on a city street just like, like this. Um, I was the oldest of three. You can see I'm in the back with the kind of puff, side puff on, this, on my head. And we spent a lot of time, even though we were growing up in the city and it looked like this, we spent a lot of time outside, right? So it was important to my parents. My dad was from Georgia. Um, to get us into the outdoors, even though we weren't uh, living in a very, uh, what people, most people would consider to be an, a natural area. Um, I would say that's where I got my first connection to nature and my sense of place. So even though I was growing up in the city, I climbed trees. My mom was notorious for pulling up a picnic blanket anywhere. There was a spot of grass and that's us in the back of a, a building um, next to a highway getting ready to have a picnic, right? I would walk for miles with my father and I, he was always collecting aluminum cans because you could get money. And that was back in the day when you could turn your aluminum can in for five cents. And so we would walk for miles while he collected these cans. And I kind of looked at the environment around me and I, I noticed the trees and, and the sky and the insects on the ground. And, you know, I started to get a connection to my neighborhood, to my city. I noticed things like in my neighborhood, in the, in the Bronx, you could easily find uh, cans on the ground, right? Uh, discarded aluminum cans. But when we went into nicer parts of the city, you would have to dig through trash or something to, to get the cans. They weren't just on the ground. And that started to concern me. I started to worry about you know, why my neighborhood was uh, different, why, why there was so much trash on the ground in my neighborhood. I began to ask my parents, right? Because once you connect a kid to uh, the environment, to an understanding of their the place around them, they've got questions. And I had questions. I asked my parents, you know, why there was so much trash and what we could do. And, you know, they didn't know what to tell me, but they kind of knew how to empower me. And so my mom said, I don't know, why don't you write a letter to the New York Times? And I did. When I was nine years old, I wrote this letter to the New York Times. And you can see that I was very, very passionate um, as a nine-year-old. Dear people, we are polluting our earth, right? I wrote several versions of this uh, letter and actually took it to multiple newspaper papers, uh, typing it up on my dad's typewriter. So you would think, okay, she had parents that grew up in a very natural area. Uh, she was raised in the Bronx, but still had a connection in nature and still had a connection to her environment enough that she wrote this letter as a nine-year-old. So 
you would think that, of course, I knew that I was destined for my career in environmental education, but actually I didn't. I, I didn't know and I didn't feel connected. When I thought of someone who was outdoorsy, I didn't picture myself. Even though I had this woman as a role model, um, this again is my mother and I got the chance to take her on her very first kayaking trip after becoming an environmental educator and leading kayaking tours on the Georgia coast. And she took to it just like she, she loved anything about being in nature. Um, but even though I had this like very adventurous role model, right, who had a connection to the outdoors. I, when I pictured someone who was an environmentalist or someone who was outdoorsy, right, I pictured folks like this. Honestly, I pictured white folks. And, you know, that is the predominant representation that we have in in our society, when we show people involved in the outdoors, this is just a Google search um, of outdoor activities. These are the first results that came up. And you can see that it is um, mostly, if not all uh, people who I would think probably identify as white. Um, and, you know, they're kind of doing either, um, they're doing some group activities, but a lot of solo activities, right? When I thought of pictures like this and people using the outdoors, it always seemed like much more adventurous than I ever thought that I would be, right? And even when they were doing things that looked like something that we did, of course my family went fishing, right? It seemed a little bit more classier, right? Classier than uh, this picture here of my uncle sitting on an upside down, um, you know, five gallon bucket next to a creek, next to a sign that definitely says, do not fish here, right? Um, we had, when we used the outdoors, it was like, um, hanging out in the streets, waiting for someone to crack open a fire hydrant, church picnics, hanging out in the backyard with our, with our family. And that for several years seemed to be different things to me. And so after being in the environmental education field for a while, I decided, um, you know, I wanted to learn about why it took me so long to make this connection and how I could maybe help to make it easier for other folks. So I went back, I got my master's of science in natural resources with a focus on interpretation and environmental education. And my project was about watershed education on the Eastern shore of Virginia and how, um, how to work with community to do effective community engagement, how we make very inclusive science communication that everyone could see themselves in, everyone could understand, everyone could feel represented. Um, and out of this, this research and this project, I ended up forming Eco-Inclusive. So over the years, I've learned a few things about you know, what do we need to be doing to make access and enjoyment of the outdoors equitable, right? One thing I learned is that representation is very, very important. And we're going to get more into that. What does representation mean? I've also learned that we can't ignore um, systems, right? We can't ignore our, our background, our history, we can't ignore bias that's built into the system. Social justice is definitely a part of thinking about the outdoors and the environment, right? And this is all a part of this larger conversation about um, conservation and environmentalism. I also learned that organizations that are really making an effort uh, to be culturally competent are better able to create spaces where community feels welcome, feels included, feels represented, and where community members have an authentic voice. So let's start off by talking about representation. 
right? Representation really means that your communities are better able to speak for themselves, that they have a voice in decision-making processes, that they are at the table when these decisions are being made, but not only like, oh, you've been brought in for the day because we're making the decision, but they're a holistic part from start to end and embedded in the organization. Representation is vital when we talk about spaces like uh, parks and open space because our country is changing. And a lot of people don't realize how quickly our country's demographics are changing. You see, our, within the next two years, our country, more than half of all of our children in our country will be uh, children that identify as minorities. Right? That is a, a large change. And when we look at the last 30 years, we can see that our population uh, statistics and demographics have really shifted. Back in 1990, our non Hispanic uh, white population was almost 76% of the population. In 2019, that was down to 59.5%. And our fastest growing demographic is our uh, Latinx or Hispanic demographic. When we look, this was the last 30 years. When we look forward to the next 30 years, we see that that demographic is going to grow even more and that our uh, non-Hispanic white demographic is going to have a lesser share of the pie. So by the time we make it to 2050, right, we're going to be what some people are calling a majority minority uh, nation. We've been having this conversation for a while, right? These, these changes didn't happen overnight and people has, have seen that our demographics are shifting. Um, so it's not a new conversation, but we have disparities. We see again and again that our organizations are not really representative of that change within our communities, right? So when we look at um, the makeup of conservation organizations in the United States, like the Green 2.0 report uh, came out a few years back and it did a survey and kind of a deep dive in the 300 conservation-based and preservation-based organizations in the U.S. And it found that many of the people of color, uh, as far as demographics, had not broken that 12 to 16 percent, what they call green ceiling, within these organizations. This is such a great report, and you should definitely check out the Green 2.0 website because they didn't stop at this report, right? They have created several reports since that talk about, oh, why is that? And why are people leaving organizations? When people of color get into organizations, why don't they stay? Why do they leave? They also showed that when you look at an organization um, and we, when we do have people of color, they are mostly represented in the internships and entry level positions. And as people make their way up the ladder uh, through organizations, there is less and less opportunity for them, less and less are they promoted. And by the time you make it to executive level positions, board level positions, we're back down to 4.6% 4, 4 of um, people of color represented in those leadership positions. We also see this reflected in our National Park Service, right? We see that the majority of our National Park Service employees are non-Hispanic white people. And that is also reflected in who is visiting our national parks, who is involved in our national parks, right? Which when we talk about preservation of land and getting people to care about the environment, right? We want them to have those connections, but if they are not uh, visiting these spaces, right? If they don't feel welcome in these spaces, then it 
could very well be uh, that they are they don't feel that um, then urge to protect to conserve later on. So we have to start having conversations about why do we still have these disparities, right? Why, if we've been talking about this, um, if we've had uh, what happened last summer uh, with George Floyd, right, was not the first discussion that we've had about civil rights and social justice. Um, and so if we've been having this conversation for several years, why do we still have these stark disparities? And I'm gonna actually throw that question out to you all. I would love it if you opened the chat and responded with what you think uh, might be some of the issues that we face um, to making our organizations and our spaces as inclusive as we want them to be. So I'm gonna give it just a second for that. All right, I see one response coming in that says power. And power is definitely a, an interesting thing, right? Um, there, there can be a lot of connotations to that, right? Who's in power? Who might want to maintain power? Um, who is affected by certain systems and dynamics? Are there any other thoughts as to why we might still have these disparities? Says there is uh, the question, is there an imbalance in population of people of color in urban versus rural areas? Uh, another thing, another comment said, a lack of feeling, a lack of feeling like you belong, right? Lack of belonging, feeling belonging. So, you know, these all are things that could contribute to who's involved. If there's an, if there are more people of color, I'm wondering if the thought is if there are more people of color in urban areas, right? Maybe um, they're not getting out into the outdoors. Um, I would say that uh, there's still outdoors in urban areas, right? And so, I think there is still that possibility, like I did as a child, to make those connections. But we don't often, when we talk about nature, we don't often talk about urban nature. And I feel like we are lacking in who we connect to this conversation by leaving that out, right? Someone said you might not feel safe when you're uh, in spaces. And definitely, um, I, I have heard that, that people and uh, some of my own family, you know, my grandmother used to say, don't go into the woods by yourself. And she was kind of calling on that understanding and that knowledge of that background of lynching and people being taken in, into the woods for awful things uh, to happen to them, right? not understanding our real history and how people of color belong to it. Uh, black, jogger, black joggers, bird watchers, even mushroom foragers feel singled out as not belonging and sometimes are targeted, having role models. Um, these are all great responses, right? So all of these things kind of play in to this thought about why, why we haven't gotten to where we want to be, right? And one of the, I, I wanna talk about two parts of this, right? We say diversity. So I've talked a little bit about diversity and representation, but that's not the only letter in this alphabet soup, right? We also have equity and we also have inclusion. And now more and more people are talking about justice. So I wanna talk about those three things, starting with inclusion. When people hear the word inclusion, oftentimes they think of 
when they define inclusion, they are actually defining the word diversity, right? When I ask people, what does the word inclusion mean? Sometimes folks will say, oh, you know, it's including lots of different people uh, from lots of different backgrounds, right? That's their idea of what inclusion is. But that's actually the definition of diversity, right? And inclusion is a little bit is a little bit deeper. You are involving and valuing people uh, regardless of their differences, but inclusion takes it a step further. Inclusion allows people to have a voice in the conversation, right? So if let's say we're an organization and we're inviting everyone to our organizational dinner table, right? Diversity is having representation all around our dinner table of lots of different uh, types of people. That's diversity. Inclusion is giving everyone a say in the menu in what's being served, right? Your programming. Everyone has a voice in that. And those voices are weighted equally. Sometimes as organizations, we invite people to our organizational dinner table and we say, eat what we're serving. This is what we have. And someone's like, oh, I can't eat this. It makes me sick. I'm gluten-free, I'm vegan. And we're like, this is all we have. And if you don't want it, then we can't serve you, right? Often that's kind of how we do our programs. We have predefined programming. And a lot of times it's thought of by the people who create the organization and not by the community. An organization that is really trying to be inclusive has a variety of different voices at the table. And we work to serve those different people. So if someone says, I'm gluten-free, I'm vegan, right? Um, then we say, we either, you can do it one of, two, one of two ways. You can create the most delicious Pep, uh, vegan pepperoni pizza, right? <laughs> With your um, faux pepperoni and gluten-free crust, right? That is so good. Uh, it's food or program so good that it serves everyone's needs, right? Or we create programming or dishes that serve individuals, your little individual pan pizza, right? Because certain groups might need different things. So we create different programming to meet those needs. Another thing to consider when we talk about um, inclusion is this thought of, are we allowing people to show up as they are, right? So for a long time, we've gone with this understanding of America as being a melting pot, right? That's the metaphor we use, that people uh, come in and we melt them down to one delicious stew called America. Um, but really, we should be thinking of our country and thinking of our organizations and our communities as salad bowls. So instead of melting people down, right, in a salad, everything maintains its integrity. You want your lettuce to be crisp and crunchy and cold. You want your onions to be a little tart and stingy. You want your raisins to be plump and juicy. You want your croutons to be dry and crunchy, right? Everything kind of maintains its own uniqueness and the different flavors work together to create something that is really delicious. So when we think about our communities and our organizations, you know, we want to invite that difference. We don't want to say if someone is different that, oh, you don't fit into our organizational culture, right? Instead, we want to provide a, a culture, an organizational culture where everyone can thrive no matter who they are, right? And we have to be, um, really open and intentional about that. I think about as how myself getting into environmental education, you know, as a as a young woman, I used to wear my hair in uh, head wraps all the time. When I started getting into environmental education, I stopped because it 
was it was not the culture right and i did not feel like that was acceptable i had even been in situations where people were questioning uh, my hair because it was different and so i knew that i needed to assimilate right i knew i needed to get a fleece quick if i was gonna fit in and so i worked and really left pieces of myself behind to assimilate into this kind of outdoor recreation and environmentalism culture. And it took me several years to be able to come back to myself and to push back on things and to say, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to give up pieces of myself to be accepted because I should be accepted as I am, right? So when we think of our organizations, when we think of our movements, our communities, we need to think of it more as a, a salad bowl and less of that melting pot. So that's inclusion. Next, I wanna talk about equity, right? Equity is the fair treatment and advancement of all people, um, regardless of their identities, right? And it, equity actually eliminates barriers that may have prevented people from certain populations and some groups from um, being on, getting to that equal footing, right? People often think of equity and equality as the same thing, but they're actually not the same thing, right? Equality means that we are giving everyone the exact same resources, exact same um, thing without consideration of the historical disparities within the system, right? So you can give someone the same resources, but if they're starting out in a hole, right, then they don't actually have the same resources or the same ability as someone who's starting out on level ground. So equity takes those things into account and provides people what they need to participate fully, right, what they need to be comfortable. Um, this can be a variety, you can tackle this a variety of different ways, right? Equity could be as simple as I've worked at some organizations that have provided gear lockers, right? Understanding that outdoor gear is really expensive. And so we're going to provide a gear locker so that if someone doesn't have what they need to fully participate in our event, then they can borrow something, right? That's one end of equity. I've seen the all totally um, all the way to the other end of equity. I know uh, one organization that actually has an equity officer as a part of their staff. They're an organization that works with teens and they work with low income teens of color to teach them about the outdoors and to give them uh, skills, outdoor recreation skills and job experience um, to get them into this field. Um, working with that, that group, they do after school programs in the school year, in the summertime, they are uh, teaching them how to be uh, river guides, whitewater river guides. And their equity officer's job is to deal with anything that would prevent a student from being able to participate fully in the program. So let's say a student stops showing up because their lights, their electricity got turned off at home because their parents couldn't pay the bill and they didn't want to take cold showers, they couldn't wash their clothes, so they just stopped showing up because they were too embarrassed. That equity officer would work with that student and work with that student's family to help find a solution for that issue because it is impeding that student from being able to participate fully, right? So there's a whole spectrum of how we can think about equity in our organizations. And we just have to have that conversation and figure out where we stand. So I have another question to you because we've talked about diversity, we've talked about equity, and we've talked about inclusion. My question to you would be, why does justice, the word justice matter when we talk about the environment in the outdoors? 
why does the word justice matter when we talk about the environment and the outdoors? And I would invite you to put that into the chat. And while you do that, and I wait, I'm going to take a sip of water. I see that we're kind of quiet in our chat, right? Oh, here we go. Some communities have always been targeted to be dumping grounds and bear the burden of environmental degradation in our country and also stealing land and labor. This is hard, someone else said, which it, it's true, it is really hard. Most of the outdoors was taken from people who are now marginalized. Outdoors and nature are health giving and cause longevity. The outdoors belongs to everyone and our economic system and culture treats it as private property belonging to the few. And that is not just. Thank you all for your um, input on this. It's a lot harder um, when we have this conversation around justice and the environment to make those ties, right? And it's less clean, but I wanna uh, helpfully give you some background to dealing, uh, to thinking about this to make it a bit cleaner. So let's go. So I wanna talk to you about environmental justice, right? And environmental justice is that fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people in environmental issues, especially ones that have to do with their, their life, right? So um, development, implementation, enforcement of environmental laws and regulations, right? Uh, the environmental justice movement actually was uh, started out of the civil, civil rights movement. And it was started by people of color um, who needed to address the inequities of environmental protection services in their communities. So a little bit of background, there are a few benchmarks that are an events that wide, are widely recognized as the founding of the environmental justice movement. And one was, you know, the public conversation around environmental racism that started emerging between the civil rights uh, movement and the um, 1982 wave of grassroots protests in response to the siting of several landfills in communities of color. In communities of color. Um, those protests became the launching point for two major studies that would solidify uh, what the environmental justice movement became. And those studies were able to confirm patterns of environmental injustice that were already patterns that were clear to the people who were living in those communities. Robert Bullard, is the father of the environmental justice movement. And he headed um, some of these studies that show this relationship between minority communities, institutional power and environmental hazards. Uh, 30 years ago, um, he started out on the scene writing his uh, groundbreaking book, Dumping in Dixie, Race, Class and Environmental uh, quality, which underscored the importance of race as a factor in citing unwanted toxic producing facilities. And so he um, he worked with scientists. He, he's a professor at the university, um, I think the University of Texas or university in Texas. And um, you know, they found that great race was the single biggest determining factor 
on if you were um, next to pollution causing areas. And so it was a bigger determining factor than socioeconomic status, meaning that a middle-class black person was more likely to be located in an area uh, like that than a poor white person. So out of this, um, out of this conversation, this uh, struggle came the 17 principles of environmental justice. And there are 17, but a couple of my favorite ones are these. Environmental justice demands that public policy be based on mutual respect and justice for all people, free from any form of discrimination and bias. Environmental justice demands the right to participate as equal partners at every level of decision making, including needs assessment, planning, implementation, enforcement, and evaluation, right? That's true inclusion. Environmental justice calls for the education of present and future generations with emphasis towards social and environmental issues based on our experiences and an appreciation of our diverse cultural perspectives, right? So these principles, and you can find them easily online, were really kind of, uh, should be the foundation of what we think of when we talk about um, justice in the environment and the work that we wanna do being inclusive of all people. One really important line in the definition for environmental justice is that fair treatment, right? Fair treatment of all people. This means when you talk about fair treatment, no one should bear the brunt or a disproportionate share of negative environmental consequences. However, when we examine this, right, we see again and again that that's not the case. We don't all breathe the same air. And study after study has just shown that when we look at who's exposed to these environmental hazards that people of color are bearing that brunt and it is having a long-term effect on their health, right? How they live their lives. There was a study that came out two years ago that was a really interesting study. They um, studied kind of that a uh, lifeline or lifespan of products in our society from where they are created to where they are purchased. And they found that some of the highest uh, polluting products, right, were disproportionately um, consumed by white Americans, those goods and services but that the source where those products were created, right? And where the toxins that were developed from uh, the consumption of those goods and services were disproportionately uh, inhaled by black and brown Americans, right? So it's interesting who is on the receiving end of these inequities. And when we talk about, um, that it, it causes health problems like asthma, right? Heart disease, all of these things, it, lung cancer. It gives that statement that <laughs> has come out of this uh, social justice movement of I can't breathe a whole new meaning, right? When, say, when someone is saying I can't breathe, they're saying I am lacking something essential to live a successful, right, a uh, healthy life. I can't breathe. So we have to start having conversations around things like environmental um, racism, right? Environmental justice is definitely tied to the social justice movement that has come out of this national conversation. When we look at racism and structural inequalities, we can't leave out environmental racism. And we see again and again, these inequitable distribution of environmental hazards based on race. Right, we see that our structures and our systems are 
kind of perpetuating these inequities throughout several levels of our society. And we cannot close our eyes. We cannot be blind to the fact that um, there is a legacy of, of racism, right? We want to feel like what happened before um, with our ancestors is totally in the past and we don't need to worry about it now. But unfortunately, that just is not the case, right? Um, the effects of past institutions that leave a racial or ethnic group in a disadvantaged social position, right? And can still continue into today. And that's what legacy racism is. That is when these institutions that were created in the past still have an effect on how people um, live today. So you think about something like redlining, right? A policy that put into place, it was a historic disinvestment in black and brown communities, right? People drew red lines around certain parts of the city that were um, areas that were predominantly uh, occupied by black and brown citizens and said, we are, we are not going to lend money to certain people in these areas. If you're a white person and you want to start a business in that neighborhood, we're not going to give you the funds to start a business in that neighborhood. You could start it somewhere else. If you were a black and brown person, you might get loans, but there were uh, exorbitant uh, prepayment penalties, there were high interest rates much higher than anywhere else, which really uh, kind of tamped down and discouraged people from starting businesses in communities, right? Those communities were often targeted later on for these things like, like factories and um, other produced, uh, pollution producing um, things. And all of this, right, it still has an effect today. When we think about those areas that have food deserts, we think about those areas that don't have resources, right? And how did it get that way? Why, why is that area uh, doesn't have the same resources as other areas? That is a legacy of a racist policy and practice. So it's important for us to start to put these things together in our head, right? And I had the opportunity to go to a talk a few months back by uh, Dr. Robert Bullard himself, the father of environmental justice. And he just did this amazing thing where he showed a series of maps that overlaid with one another to show how we still have that legacy and the effects that it still has today. So I wanna show you uh, some maps because it was really impactful for me. And the first map I would like to show you is this one, right? So this is uh, the United States in 1860. And you can see that we've got um, our freed states, our slave states, our somewhere in between states. Um, this slave states is predominantly uh, where you would find Black folks and where predominantly Black people still live today, right? We were brought over, um, we worked in those states as slaves, and then a lot of people stayed. So you look in uh, flat, flash forward um, almost 100 years, and you can see that those same states are the states that were under Jim Crow laws, were, were the same states where segregation was required by law, right? So we have that, that history, that legacy of racism um, still shown. And you think a lot of people think, oh, because we, um, we weren't a part of those states, right? Then we're, we're all good, right? But that's not the case. Um, things like the Green Book, right? Which was the historic Negro motorist guide um, that helped black people to travel safely across the country by listing um, the safe spaces to stop and the spaces that were not safe to stop. Um, that book was not created for Southern states because in the South, you uh, states were very uh, cities, 
uh, communities, towns were very open, right? And they had things labeled. If it was a sundown town, there was a sign going in the town that it was a sundown town. And if you were a person of color, you better get out, right? Before the sun went down. Um, it was the other states in the North and in the West where there still was rampant racism, but it was less well marked, right? And so people needed that guide to be able to get across safely. So we look at these two slave states, we look at segregation, and we look at where Black people are today, right? And we're still in those areas. We look at um, people living in poverty, areas in the United States and that mimics, right, those same states. Uh, we look forward at uh, resources, where, where people, the red is, you know, where um, indicates where people do not have access to uh, things like a supermarket and also don't have cars to get them there. Right? We have lung cancer distribution in the United States. Starting to see a pattern, right? Where, um, where we have a disinvestment in communities, where we have high concentration of people of color, we have high concentration of uh, diseases. And so lung cancer, heart disease, right? Same states, stroke, Right, And then all of this leads to a shorter life expectancy overall. When we think about, when we talk about why should this matter long-term, right? Well, people have, are, are not healthy. They are not able to live a, a long life because of these systems of oppression that are still affecting them today, right? And you can actually look up life expectancy in your um, particular state. I'm going to show you an example. I'm going to stop this share and I'm going to bring over another share because the CDC actually has a life expectancy map of the United States. And so you can uh, go here and like I go to Colorado and I can see that my state, so it shows you your state life expectancy, which is the one on the bottom is 80 years, right? 80.5 years. That's the average life expectancy for the state. If I go into, this is the Denver metro area, right? So I go over to the Denver metro area and I can see that even though the state's life expectancy is um, 80 years, you go to this track, which this area is called uh, Globe Villalaria Swansea, and it is one of the most polluted zip codes in the United States, right? It's kind of the intersection of several things. We've got uh, factories, we've got highways, right? All intersecting in this area. And the life expectancy is down to 72 years, right? So an eight year difference, right? Between the two. We go across town to one of the more wealthy areas across town and they're actually, they're living longer than the state's life expectancy right, at, um, at 85.6 years, right? So that's a big difference between 72 years and 85 years. That's a lot of living, right? That's a lot more life. And these environmental hazards and pollutants, right, in these low income, often black and brown areas are shortening people's lifespan. All right, let me get my slide back. So when we think about, when we think about all of these things, right, the picture starts to become clearer for the importance of 
justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, to environmental movements, right? When we talk about um, the difference in who has provided protections Right, we're all, we're, we love the outdoors, we love the environment, right? And one thing that we know is that the environment is an ecosystem. It's all tied together, right? So we might think that we are safe because what's happening in those black and brown neighborhoods aren't, isn't happening in our neighborhood. But really that's only, we're only safe for, for a short time right because we're a connected ecosystem we see the issues that are happening to our planet right we see the effects of climate change we see the effect of all of these things and what happens is um, the reason why those spaces are allowed to exist because we have certain people in our community that we think of unconsciously right but they're still thought of as disposable we're not going to have that factory in my, not in my backyard, but it can go somewhere else, right? And when we have disposable people, right? Then we create disposable pieces of land, right? And that's where those environmental um, injustices happen. So the solution to environmental injustice is not to continually relocate toxic waste and pollution to different neighborhoods of our planet, right? The real call from environmental justice uh, advocates and educators is to re-examine the impact on our urban environments, reclaim right what has happened to our planet in the face of modernization, right? And claim the earth below. When I think of um, the statement of loving my neighbor as my own, I feel like it means that we understand that our future is interconnected with the futures of others. And what has led us to this moment, right, is that disconnection. And we have to be reconnected to one another. We're not different groups, right? We're, we're one group, we're one race, and we have to gain that connection to one another again. Organizations also have to be willing to examine the roots of their foundings, right? They have to be willing to look back and say, what part of uh, social injustice, oppression, right? How do we play a role in this? And what is the work that we're doing to dismantle it? So my next question to you all is, how could you start to integrate justice, equity, and inclusion into your community, into the work that you do? How would you start to integrate those things? And I would love it if you could put it into the chat. Also remember, we're gonna have some questions and answers. Um, at the end. So if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A so that when, as I wrap up in just a few minutes, we can um, get to, to sharing and have a conversation. Okay, as people think about this, you know, how might I start to integrate this? What does this mean for the work that I do or my place in my community? I want to share some things for you to think about. One way that we can start to have this conversation, right, is to build our own self-awareness. We have to be aware of our own culture, um, and oftentimes we don't think of ourselves as having culture. We think of other people who are different from us as having a culture, but we all have culture, right? And we have to understand that, you know, we are kind of bound by, or have been bound by our culture, by maybe uh, unconscious bias that we have. We need to understand what are the limitations of our worldview and our experience, and how do we expand that through connection, right? 
we also have to really value diversity as a have to have, not a nice to have, not a, oh, it's, it's okay, right? We have to stop making excuses about why we aren't inclusive, why we aren't diverse, and really value diversity as something that uh, we have to have within our communities and our organization and work towards that goal. We need to be interacting with diverse groups Right, and it's really, it's interesting when I, I talk with people sometimes, they say, you know, well, we don't, I, I don't know, we don't have diverse groups <laughs> within, our, within our community, right? You have diverse group and it, it is, diversity is a wide topic, right? A wide field. So we talk a lot about racial diversity because that's what's changing our country. That's what's changing our nation. But there's lots of different diversity around ability, disability, sexual orientation, so on, so forth, right? Lots of things that make us make up who we are. And so we need to be interacting with people who are different from us. We need to be seeking out groups that we can learn from. We also have to assess the barriers in our communities, what is keeping people from accessing our resources, right? What are preventing people? And we need to make community-driven solutions to those barriers. We also have to assess our rules and regulations because oftentimes we create rules and regulations that are related to how we view the world. Right. So if someone, um, oops, excuse me. So if someone uh, sees that big green field of grass and those, so they might be thinking soccer, right? But we say keep off the grass, right? No, no, no games over here, right? We have uh, don't wear your street clothes in the pool. Think about that rule, right? So that rule is probably set up because they don't want people coming in with dirty clothes and uh, getting into the pool with it, right? But is street clothes really the term that we want to use? Because some people don't own bathing suits. So would it be better to say wear clean clothes into the pool so that we are more inclusive of people who may not have certain swimwear, right? How can we evaluate what messages we are sending? We also need to be willing to do our homework and represent diverse champions for the outdoors. There are people out there, we tell the same story about the same three white men who were our founding fathers of the outdoor movement, right? And there is such, it is so more, much more complex and diverse and we can tell those stories, right? We also need to think about different ways that people use the outdoors. It's not just all climbing mountains, right? It's not uh, just all hikes, right? We've got different ways that people use the outdoors. And the only thing that is necessary for something to be considered an outdoor activity is for it to be taking place outside, right? So we don't need, as a part of that, we need to think about how we define nature because nature isn't something that's far out there. It, nature is something that's all around us, right? That we are all a part of. And we need to celebrate that. We need to redefine that so that we kind of cast a wider lens toward who's involved in this conversation, right? So that little old me as a nine-year-old in Bronx, New York, who wrote that letter in the New York, to the New York Times, right? But still didn't think of herself as an environmentalist because that's not what I saw represented, right? We need to widen that net so we can bring more people into this conversation. So I see that we have lots of really great um, suggestions and thoughts in our chat. And I would like to leave you with this last question what would you like to do? What is going to be your tangible action to make 
the outdoors, your communities, and your organizations more inclusive, right? There's several steps that we can take. There's lots that we can do. And the first uh, first step, right? We got to decide what's that first step in our, our thousand mile journey, right? We just have to walk forward. So I'm going to leave you uh, with this. 2022, uh, 2020 and 2021, right? There's been a lot. It's been a little bit going on, right? It's been a, a time of, of struggle, of unrest, of deep conversations. But moments like the conversations that we've been having in the last year can amplify and lay bare structural inequities and can also galvanize us to make change. This is a brave new world. And we can create a space where everyone feels welcome, everyone feels connected, where everyone can breathe, right? Because we have dealt with these structural and uh, in systemic inequities and oppression. We can do it. It just takes us saying that yes, I'm going to do my part to make change where I can and when I can. So I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and speak with you today. Um, I want to urge you to stay connected. If you are on social media, please follow me. My um, handle is QueenWork, spelled K-W-E-E-N-W-E-R-K. Uh, you can find me across TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also follow my work with Inclusive Journeys and uh, Eco Inclusive uh, across platforms as well. And I hope that this isn't the last time our paths cross. And now we're going to roll into questions. So I'm going to stop my screen share so that we can hopefully have a conversation. Hello, hello. Hi, that was so wonderful and informative and I'm just letting everything marinate in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I could just like hit repeat and play it again right now. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Parker, for that presentation. It truly was phenomenal. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything, Rachel, before we might take some questions. <laughs> yeah, I also just wanted to thank you so much, Parker. That's so inspiring and has really pushed my thinking um, as someone who works with students in our public school system and, and the green teams. And it's really making me think about who we're reaching, who we're not, and who I'd like to really um, reach out to more. And um, so I really appreciate you kind of pushing us in that way. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, so we didn't have any questions. So folks who are tuned in, if you have some, send them in the Q&A. Um, but I have one. <laughs> so I'll ask it. Um, because I think it's an area that not only I struggle with in my role, but I think across the town in different departments. Um, but that idea of outreach and communications and reaching folks who we don't really hear from who are probably not included in some of these spaces and conversations. Do you have any I'd say suggestions or recommendations on how to start to tackle that outreach. Um, yeah, uh, well, a couple of things. Um, I think organizations spend a lot of time trying to get people to come to them, right, mm -hmm. rather than being willing to go go to them. And so, if there are community parts of our community that we're not reaching, um, there are probably organizations that are right, whether that's the local church, right, or youth group, or whatever, the pool hall, like wherever, like, we have to be willing to go outside the, the walls, right, of, of our organizations and make real community connections. Also, community connection isn't one way, right? It's not about you just come to my, this is what I'm offering, I want you to come here, right? But it's all, it's about building relationships, uh, getting ourselves to be trusted, showing up for the things that matter 
to them, right? So that they'll show up for what matters to us, right? We have to show that we really care and are connected to our community. Thank you. So lots of relationship building shall be in the works. <laughs> um, we did just have a couple audience questions come through. Um, I'll read the first one. So it's, are there any environmentalists you can share about um, that you think middle school kids would particularly find inspirational? Huh. Well, you know, I think that um, th th there, there are quite a few, right? If you want to just think about um, who's involved in outdoor spaces. Some fun ones, though, are ones that we don't necessarily uh, think of, right? So uh, folks like Harriet Tubman, right, who uh, definitely uh, knew knew her plants, knew her birds, right, was was a naturalist, right? But we don't talk about her in, in those terms. Uh, Buffalo soldiers, right? These kind of historic figures that, um, like, if we can think about the work that folks have done differently. And then there's contemporary folks, you know, that are, are working all over. And so, um, and anyone, right? We can talk about Teddy Roosevelt. We can talk about anyone. <laughs> I'm looking at the next one. Yeah, um, the, someone's asking about the Municipal Vulnerability Program. Um, if you know about that, if you have any thoughts on it and um, it leans into projects addressing inequity. Got it. I, I don't know about that uh, program. Um, I'm trying to, I'm <laughs> looking right now <laughs> online. Um, but I'm not. I'm not sure that I would have um, enough information without maybe kind of going through this Massachusetts.gov <laughs> explanation of what the program is. That's okay. Um, Rachel, do you want to tackle some of the questions in the chat? I think. Sure. Um, okay. Let's see. So it looks like. Um, we had a question about, do you think gardening can be an easier activity or space to gather in a more inclusive way? Versus yeah. hiking and nature exploration. I'm seeing it goes on here. A different way to connect with nature, including reference to foods. Definitely, you know, um, my grandmother garden, garden was, gardening was a part of my, my background and my family and what was taught to us and lots of people of color have that in their, their background. Um, and we don't necessarily think of it as an outdoor activity and it definitely is, right? I think there are so many things that fit under that umbrella, right? I think about um, my grandmother who not only garden, washed her clothes by hand, hung them out on the line, reused her Tupperware containers, reused her Ziploc bags, washed them, turned them inside out to dry. Um, all of these things that were conservation efforts. And if people had, no, no one told her she was a conservationist or an environmentalist, right? My uncle who rode his bike to work every day, 20 miles, because he didn't have a car, right? No one told him he was preserving the environment, fighting climate change, right? Because we have this kind of disconnect between activities that are done out of um, necessity and activities that are done for, for fun and for leisure. And so I think it's important that we have that conversation when we think about what are activities that are going to appeal to people and that are more inclusive, what are folks doing already that we can um, talk about, we can bring to the forefront, that we can let them know that, that that's, that's over here too. That's a part of outdoor recreation. That's a part of our uh, 
tent of environmentalism, you belong here and let's have a conversation. Looks like a couple more questions came through the Q&A. Um, one question was, could you connect outreach by meeting folks at food banks and soup kitchens and form groups for sharing information? Yeah, so um, let's see. I'm gonna look at that question some more. Some more. So I'm looking over in the answer. Can you connect outreach by meeting folks? So yeah, you can definitely, if you're trying to get out in the community, meet people in those, those spaces, right? And share information in those spaces. But also, um, like I urged before, right? It's about showing up for, for their thing. And sometimes you have to do that a little bit before you expect any type of, of return, right? So not just there to drop off um, flyers, but because I wanna build a relationship with you and understand what is the work you're doing. And it's important for me as much as it's important to you because I'm a part of this community too. And we've got another one. Um, so it's hard to figure out how to make some of these asks that you've been talking about and finding out um, what a more diverse breadth of our, our population might care about environmentally in our community. Can you help us think through how we could carry something out here, um, some kind of survey or a public meeting or something more fun? <laughs> so, Okay, that it, so the first part of the question is that um, it can be hard to do these types of, of things or find out what our community members need, right? So how might we go about um, do, doing that? Mm -hmm. I think figuring out what community members' interests might be that we're not hearing from. Yeah. Um, well, you know, there there are. Uh, I think I think again, it goes back to those relationships and having people <clears throat> as a part of your organization or involved in the work that you're doing from the beginning. It's not a. It's it's not easy, right? Building those relationships, especially when you're like, I don't. I don't know. I don't know anybody. I don't know any black people. <laughs> like, how am I supposed to build that relationship? That I I know that can be hard, and I know that can be uh, scary, and I know that it's a long process, right? We have to be willing to go out there and make those authentic connections and bring people in because, really, what is the most um, the ideal is that before we're doing something like a survey or a public meeting, right? That we already have those, those voices. It's not that someone is, I'm not calling someone from the community, you're over there, I'm over here, and now we're gonna bring together just so I can hear uh, your thoughts in this space and now we're separated again, but you are making the community a part of the work that you do through that relationship building. And so, um, some things that I have seen is organizations that go into parts of the community that they aren't well, well serving, right? Show up at their, so they said public meeting, show up at their public meeting and, um, you know, ask them in their space, what are the things that they're, uh, wanting to know more about, what are the things they can help them with and, um, taking that to do projects within the community, again, going with them. So like I know a local um, recycling organization uh, went to a community that has been really hardly hard impacted by COVID, um, several community members dying. It is a, a low income community of color. Uh, they, on top of that, with the unrest uh, last summer, had several community members that had um, 
been involved in, in shootings and deaths by gun violence. And they wanted to do something to clean, to reclaim, to clean their community. And so they did a trash pickup uh, recycling day in their local park it, because the community members were involved in it and invested in it and they wanted to clean their their neighborhood that lots of community members showed up they had um they decorated all of the sidewalks in the park during the day so while people were out collecting kids were in the park doing this uh side sidewalk chalk art they had music going on and it was really a community driven event that was created by what the community felt like they needed at at that time I just noticed another question in the chat. Um, one of the uh, attendees asked, I like to welcome people of color to our little preserve, but our mostly white community makes me reluctant to do so. Any advice? Yeah, I, you know, um, I think if you are located in a mostly white community, a lot of people uh, talk about that and talk about how we might not even have any community, any people of color uh, come through, right? Uh, your job is to make your place as inclusive and as welcoming as possible for anyone who might stumble across, right? So a lot of times studies have shown that uh, populations of color that maybe aren't usually out in the outdoors do so or have some of their first recreation adventures when they are traveling, right? They're, they're going cross country, um, they hear something about, oh, you have to stop at this space and then they, they do it. It might be their one, they haven't been to their nearby nature, right? But it might be their one foray out into the outdoors. And so like with that thought, even though we may not have a community that's very diverse, we are bound to have people come through and we want that experience to be really powerful. As for the community around you, I don't know if you're, you're saying that maybe the community itself won't be, um, won't be welcoming, right? But I, uh, it's gonna be your job just to think about your organization. I once had a boss that told me they almost didn't hire me because the community was uh, that I was coming into was a very white community and they were worried about my uh, ability to, if I would be welcomed, if I would be able to communicate with all of the watermen and the farmers. And, you know, I got there and I, I, I thrive within, like I had people bringing me deer. I learned how to, you know, waterfowl hunt, like all of these things, right? Um, and so we shouldn't underestimate people's ability to um, persevere in uh, situations that might seem like they may not totally be, be welcomed. So. Great, well, I think we're, we have one question also that was submitted, but I think your last response kind of touched upon that, um, you know, really working to just make your space inclusive and as welcoming if you're looking to include other people. <laughs> so I think that addresses that. Um, and I think we are just about wrapping up on time. So I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, so wonderful. And I love, you know, one thing that COVID has done is brought us closer together across the air airwaves and having this ability to come and be with you there, even when I'm all the way over here, has been wonderful. So thank you for the opportunity. Yes, absolutely. And Rachel, I don't know if you want to say a couple words. <laughs> Yes, just want to uh, thank you so much, Parker, for joining us. And um, this has been such an inspiring 
um, conversation. And um, we really invite everyone to continue joining us for our Eco Week events. They run through the Saturday, as I said, May 15th, um, arlingtonma.gov slash Eco Week. Please join us for more programming. There's a great panel tomorrow evening on plastic pollution and how we can stop that. Um, but we'd love to see you at all our remaining events. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Parker. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Have a good night.